Hi, and welcome to this new episode of Sartorial Talks Perfume Corner. Uh, this episode is meant as a primer for those of you who may not know all there is to know about perfumery and who needs a quick guide to understand a few notions and principles that, in my opinion, are important to understand the wonderful art of perfumery. Of course, this is not meant to be an in-depth guide. This is just a few general principles that I believe are important to know. Um, so, if you haven't seen the first episodes in this series, I suggest you do right now. Here's the link in the corner. Um, and uh, if you, after watching this episode, wish for me to answer any further questions you might have, please don't hesitate to write them down in the comment section. And if you're already uh, knowledgeable in perfumes and you think I've forgotten something important to mention, please write an angry comment in the box below. Without further ado, let's get started. Le Comité Français du Parfum, basically the Perfumers Union, has classified perfumes into seven main categories, or families. There's the citrus family, also known as Hesperide, which are perfumes made from the essential oils obtained from citrus fruits, such as oranges, limes, bergamot, grapefruits, yuzu, and so on and so forth. Of course, there's more. Each family is comprised of several subfamilies. For instance, there's the woody citruses, which is basically a citrus perfume with added notes of woods. Famous citrus fragrances would include Eau d'Orange Verte by Hermes, the Yuzu by Caron, or Blenheim Bouquet by Penhaligans. Then there's the floral family, which comprises perfumes made from flower fragrances, such as roses, lavender, jasmine, lily, tuberose, etc. The most famous floral perfume in the world is also arguably the most famous perfume ever, period. It's the legendary Channel No. 5, which is notable for its use of aldehyde, which is a synthetic compound, though it does occur naturally, which boasts some fat, waxy, metallic or even citrusy qualities depending on how it's used. Then you've got the fougère family, or fern in English, which despite its name isn't about the smell of actual ferns at all. Rather, it's based off a famous 19th century perfume by Jean-François Houbigan called Fougère Royale, Royal Fern in English, which featured a fragrant accord of lavender, geranium, oak moss, various woody notes and coumarin, which is a substance found, for instance, in tonka beans or in certain variety of sage. Coumarin by itself is said to be reminiscent of the smell of freshly mown hay, this accord of lavender, geranium, oak moss, woody notes and coumarin is at the heart of pretty much every fougère. Fougère can be floral, spicy, aromatic or even oriental. Similar to the fougère family, we have the Chypre family, which is named after an early 20th century perfume by François Coty, aptly called Chypre, which was built around a strongly distinctive accord of bergamot, jasmine, labdanum and patchouli. Uh, these kinds of perfume typically start with a blast of citrus, which opens up to a blend of flowers and fruits to dry down some rather balsamic notes, which is to say some notes that are heavy, sweet, hot and kind of sugary. Chypre can be floral, green, leathery or even aldehyde flowery. For a good example of a popular Chypre perfume, still for sale today, unlike the original Chypre by Coty, check out Guerlain's Mitsuko. Then there's the Woody family, which is typically associated with masculine perfumery. Uh, these are highly structured perfume, which usually contain sandalwood, cedar, patchouli, and of course vetiver the latter being a subcategory all by itself. These perfumes are typically fairly linear and with good lasting power because wood notes are typically heavier molecule which stay very close to the skin and anchor whatever lighter particle is above them. Check out my personal favorite vetiver, uh, Vetiverio by Diptych or Guerlain's Legendary Vetiver or Creed's Spice and Wood for good examples of woody perfumes. The oriental family, also known as the amber family, is comprised of warm, sensual notes with exotic and rare accents. They typically feature notes of vanilla, amber, patchouli or labdanum, which is a resin obtained from cistus shrubs. Orientals are a curious thing, they tend to have a very distinctive personality and they tend to remain pretty much the same throughout their entire lifespan. Famous orientals would include Chalimar by Guerlain, Opium by Yves Saint Laurent, and my personal favorite, Ambre Sultan 
by Serge Lutens. To cap things off, let's visit the weirdest family of all, the leather family. These powerful juices are built around strong, smoky, spicy notes, woods and tobaccos, spices and animalic notes, and of course, leather. But as you probably know, you can't actually distill leather. You wouldn't know that by smelling perfumes such as Cuir de Russie by Chanel or Cuir Intense by Pierre Cardin or even Yatagan by Caron. So I've talked in length about notes, but what are notes exactly? Well, notes are smells. Uh, they are typically organized in pyramid form, which we call the olfactive pyramid. This pyramid has got three layers. There's the top layer, uh, with the top notes, which are the lightest, most volatile notes, which are the first to evaporate after you spray a perfume. Then there's the middle or the heart notes, which typically uh, make up the bulk of the perfume's personality. Um, they tend to be notes of flowers, of fruits, of spices, and they tend to evolve throughout the day. Then there's the base notes, the heaviest of them all. They are typically notes of woods, of resin, uh, very balsamic notes, and these notes tend to act as anchors, anchoring literally the most volatile notes closer to the skin, and they are pretty much what gives any perfume their lasting power. So that's pretty clear cut, right? But there's a catch, and there's a small nuance that I think is important to understand. Notes aren't the same thing as ingredients. Pyramids usually don't represent the exact composition of the perfume. They're mostly a useful marketing tool that's meant to give you a feel of what the perfume is about. Because it bears repeating, notes aren't the same thing as ingredients. For example, there's an entire family that's called the leather family, and even though I haven't been to that many chemistry class back in high school, even I know that you can't distill leather. Yet, you will routinely find in many perfumes, especially in masculine perfumery, notes of leather being mentioned in the olfactory pyramid. So what gives? Because leather cannot be an ingredient. Instead, what you'll find in such a perfume will be strong resin, aromatic wood, or even a synthetic compound that, in a way in which it's used, is reminiscent of the smell of leather. This is what notes are. They are the smell that the ingredient evokes, they are not the ingredient. Many perfumes use synthetic compound for various reasons, but the name of the compounds is, is usually not an easy sell. For instance, we've got galaxolide, which is a type of synthetic musk, uh, that is to say a synthetic aroma compound which is designed to emulate the scent of deer musk. Uh, it's described as being sweet, floral and woody. But no brand will put galaxolide on their pyramid or call their perfume Eau de Galaxolide. It's just doesn't, it just doesn't sell as well. Instead, they're likely to put stuff such as white musk or even just musk. In a similar fashion, civette refers to the civette's anal gland, the civette being a species of wildcat. In its anal gland secretes a musky substance with strong fecal accents, but as it ages, dries down and is reminiscent of warm, honeyed vanilla. Very pleasant, actually. But no brand will ever put anal gland on their pyramid instead. They will put civette. The same is true for ambergris, ombre gris, which is basically whale's vomit, which is a base ingredient in many, many famous perfumes, but ambergris with its French tint just sounds so much better and is much more bankable than whale's vomit for obvious reasons. Of course, especially in the case of the civet's anal gland, nowadays uh, perfumers use synthetic compounds that emulate the smell, usually without reproducing the fecal accents. What I'm getting at is this. When you smell rose in a perfume, you may not be smelling a perfume that's actually made with distilled roses. Instead, you may be smelling a chemical compound that just happens in the way it's used to be reminiscent of the smell of an actual rose, but in a way that is actually usable in perfumery. Because perfumery, at its core, is chemistry. 
The pyramid is useful insofar as it gives you an idea of what to expect from any given perfume. This is useful, obviously, from a marketing perspective uh, for the reason I described earlier, but that's not all. It's also useful from a consumer standpoint. Because the sense of smell is indeed highly subjective and highly unreliable. Did you ever go to one of those restaurants where you dine sitting in the dark? Well, if you have, you know how hard it is to actually recognize what it is you're eating based on your sense of taste and smell alone. That's because we eat with our eyes as much as with our taste buds. And for a sense of smell, this is the same principle. If you've never been to one of those restaurants to illustrate what I'm saying, just try this at home. Just dice a few different vegetables, whatever you have handy at hand, and then have someone blindfold you and feed you those small dices one by one and try to recognize what it is you're actually eating. You'd be surprised, even if you have a very good palate, at how, how hard this, of an exercise this is. We taste, and by extension, we smell with our brains as much as with our actual senses, which means that our expectations are also very important in whether or not you'll enjoy a perfume. The bottle design, the name of the perfume, the outlandish commercials, all this is meant to help steer your brain towards the feeling, the concept that the perfume is trying to convey. It's all smoke and mirrors, because perfumes are very, very seldom the actual distillation of all the notes contained in the pyramid. However, whatever is in the juice evokes the notes that are written down in the pyramid. And that's because perfumes are hard to market, they are a very abstract commodity. And even then, I, I say perfume since the beginning of this show, but what about people who wear eau de toilette or eau de parfum or cologne? What's the difference? What makes a perfume a perfume? Modern perfumes are alcohol-based, ethylic alcohol-based, which is a neutral alcohol that doesn't denaturate the, the smell or the, the, the nature of the juice, which is basically what the perfumers cook in their large vats. This is the concentrated smell of any given perfume. The juice is then added to the alcohol in a certain proportion, and this is this proportion, this ratio, this perfume juice to alcohol ratio that determines the nature of your perfume. At less than 1% perfume juice to alcohol ratio, you have aftershave, your typical aftershave, which means that yes, absolutely, that fresh splash you feel on your skin after applying aftershave, that's just mostly alcohol. At 4%, you've got eau fraiche, fresh waters. They are fresh and they don't last very long. At between 2 to 5%, you've got eau de cologne which are longer lasting and a bit more complex. Between approximately 5 to 15%, you've got your typical eau de toilette, which is basically what most people refer to when they're actually talking about perfumes. This is pretty much the most popular format. Between 15 to 20%, you've got your eau de parfum. Stronger, more expensive to produce and to purchase as well. Uh, not necessarily more complex, but definitely less subdued than eau de toilette. Over 20%, all the way up to 40%, you've got your extrait de parfum or perfumes extract, which at this point, only a few drops are necessary to get you through the whole day. These are highly concentrated pieces of perfumery. Obviously, all these numbers are approximate. It depends on the nature of the juices of the ingredients used, but this should give you a general idea. Usually the more concentrated the juice to alcohol ratio is, the stronger and the longer lasting the fragrance will be. So this concludes this episode of the Perfume Corner. This was meant as a quick primer. Um, I hope you learned a few useful things. If you wish for me to clarify a few notions, a few concepts, don't hesitate to write your question down in the comments. I will read them all and try to answer to as many as I can. Again, if I've forgotten something you deem important as a perfume aficionado, please also mention it in the comments. Um, I'll be happy to uh, read them all and to interact with you uh, in a polite and measured way. Thank you everyone for following this episode of The Perfume Corner. Again, if you wish to see the first episode, click the link in this corner. 
and I'll see you next time for a future episode of The Perfume Corners. Cheers.